I think we are recording. Welcome, everyone, to a very special episode with a very special guest. Today, I'm joined by Nuri Vitachi, a longtime journalist and author who has spent most of his life in Hong Kong, and who I found out after reading his book probably would have made a pretty good Indiana Jones substitute, which I'll get to <laughs> a little bit later. But first of all, Nuri, thank you very much for joining me. Very special guest. I bet you say that to all the guests. Go on, Daniel. You do, don't you? I, I do, but I only talk to really special guests, though. So, I mean, to get onto the show to begin with, it's it's like a prerequisite. So, you know, it still means something. <laughs> okay, well, this is actually a mutual fan club because I started following Daniel way back in 2019. And uh, he's been like the voice of reason uh, in a world of madness. It's funny, the, the non-journalists have been doing such a uh, so much of a better job than, than the journalists. I'm, I'm like ashamed of my profession. Uh, I mean, th this has been a really interesting um, experience for everybody, a learning experience for everybody, seeing what unfolded. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I covered the, the Hong Kong protests extensively on yeah, YouTube and, and Twitter also. Um, and actually, when we were going to have this conversation, uh, I, I must say, uh, it wasn't going to be based on your book. I was going to get your book eventually because I thought that... Um, you know, you know how much I covered Hong Kong. I was like, okay, you know what? I, I pretty much know the whole story anyways. But I really like the way that you uh, put everything together. I think it's so needed because of how... There it is. Yeah, the, the other side of Hong Kong. It just... It, you know, it, it, honestly, it was, it was even a bit emotional because it was just... It was so refreshing to see the facts laid out in such a concise way because of how fake all of the rest of the coverage was. And it was a wake up call for a lot of people. Finally, waking people up to see how media works or perhaps doesn't work is probably even a, a, a better way to say it. But first of all, actually, I want to address my only concern that my only main issue with the book, which is that you you downplay yourself quite a lot, but you're a bit of a local legend. All of my friends who I spoke to, they know who you are. Some of them are quite famous, and and although they're personal friends with me, they'd never want to publicly associate with me. <laughs> and they and they and they all know they all know who you are. So I think um, maybe a good starting point would be for you to tell us a little bit more about your you know history in Hong Kong before we get into things. Um, you know, I'm I'm a traditional old school journalist. Uh, um, my my father was a journalist, inspired me uh, in Sri Lanka. That's where our family's from, and uh, eventually we ended up in. Uh, in UK, and I work for all the, the normal people, um, uh, the, the Daily Express, the Telegraph, or all, all these sort of. Uh, oh, let's up. put "normal" in, in quote in quotations yeah. there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, actually, we put journalism in quotes as well. I <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did. A, I did a bit of. I was a freelancer or a shift worker. I did subbing on the Times. I wrote headlines on the uh, on the Sunday papers. Uh, I, I did features on The Guardian, so all the standard journalistic things, and eventually came to uh, Asia, started working here, and uh, um, wrote a lot of books, worked for the South China Morning Post, uh, Wall Street Journal Group, all the standard uh, mm -hmm. the journalistic uh, uh, outlets, had a spot, regular spot on CNN and BBC and so on. Um, but I was very much had the, the Western goggles on. I saw everything, you know. Basically, the Western view is, uh, uh, can be summed up in four words. China bad, democracy good. Okay, and you put right. these two bad, democracy good goggles and see everything through that. And uh, I did too. That was my standard line. And if you look right. back at my articles five or ten years ago, you know, they, they're all through that lens. So uh, it took me a yeah. long time to escape from it, really. And you said you brushed across something in your book. You said that you also uh, taught a course or a class called The Power of Stories. What, what was that? I found that interesting, but you didn't really dig into that too, too much in that. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I teach at Hong Kong's biggest uh, university, the uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And um, it's full of, uh, it's a very creative place. It's full of filmmakers, animators. Uh, the, the guy who drew Shrek uh, is uh, one of our graduates. Um, so it's uh, full of creative people, but uh, they got me in as a sort of professor of storytelling. So to teach them to structure stories and, and design characters. So it's great. It got me in with Hong Kong young people and uh, and helped me to learn how they think. That's really important to me. And not also during the siege of Poly U, my staff card managed to get me into the building when uh, 
when it was all uh, surrounded. There was actually now I want I want to get into why you kind of wrote this book. Let's see here. I don't I don't have I don't have the quotes here, but you seem pretty adamant that this is just not something you do. So yeah. uh, and and people even asked you to do it in the beginning, and you're like, no, no, this isn't my area of specialty. So what went wrong? <laughs> right. yeah. Because of the pressure of one side on the politics. It becomes a very painful thing because, uh, and I know you've suffered a lot through this as well, because you just try to say, well, look, there's another, there's another truth here, and this truth actually may be bigger than the, the, the truth you're pushing. And you get the weight of the world uh, suddenly dropping on your shoulders. Uh, you know, the biggest, richest, powerful, most powerful media in the world, from the New York Times to the BBC, they all push the NATO view, and they pretend they don't, but they do. Uh, and um, it's just, and, and and it falls on you like a, a ton of bricks. In fact, I give you a good example from uh, from today's New York Times. Like today's New York Times has a piece on the uh, Australia submarine deal here, uh, right. Australia, US, and UK. And you know what it says? It says uh, I'll I'll read it to you. China is swelling into a military superpower. India, Vietnam, and Singapore are spending more on arms. Japan is learning to do the same. Now, Australia, backed by the United States and Britain. So basically, it says, like, oh, these Asians, oh, those Chinese, you know, they're doing such terrible, terrible things. They're stirring up trouble. And now, US, Australia, and UK have been forced to step in. You know, it's just so maddening. You know, it, it really so is absurd funny. when you really look at the big picture of, you know, who has all of these bases or lily pads, as they call them, around the world. Um, who is the source of these international aggressions? Um, you know, while people are talking about supposed human rights abuses that are going on in China, they're committing actual human rights abuses across the entire world, even outside of their own borders. And for people to read this stuff and just not think, hold on a second here, there's something really weird about the way we're framing this. Yeah. Um, it, it's really remarkable. And, you know, when you started speaking out, there's all kinds of mechanisms in place to, to, to um, stop uh, alternative narratives from getting out fr from a, a social level, from a traditional media level to a social media level, which we'll get into in a little bit. But what I'll do, and I apologize if, if this is going to seem a little bit messy, because I just have, I literally just finished reading your book 12 hours ago, less than 12 hours ago. And I want to go through a few different things. Um, and I'm going to try to remember why I highlighted them, what, 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 what stood out for me. So I think this probably ties into um, uh, answering my first question, actually, looking at this quote now. It says, you said, an increasing number of people in my network, the most worried ones being parents, uh, were asking me to bring some sense into, into the discussion about the extradition law. Um, so that's when you said it initially. No, sorry, I'm a humorist, I replied. Um, and yeah, that's the quote you said a long time ago. I swore I would never, never go back to seriously covering politics. Um, it can be a very nasty game played by very nasty people. Um, so that was what where my framing came from, saying what went wrong. And, and I think probably you found after covering it that it still is a nasty game covered by nasty people, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into in a bit. But then when you started doing this, you said you became a conduit for thousands of Hong Kong people who wanted to say something, uh, uh, but are unable to say it themselves. And that that really connected with me also, because that was one of the things that happened to me, probably on a smaller scale than happened to you, because I only lived in Hong Kong for two years. And when I started making these videos and started saying, hold on a second, there's something wrong here. I had so many people like my son's classmates, parents who hadn't spoken to me in years, sending me messages saying they saw my video go viral on Facebook. They just wanted to say, thank you. We can't say these things. If we say them, it's too risky. You know, the rioters will come after us. Mm -hmm. I had a Hong Kong friend, an artist who came over to Shenzhen and during, during the height of these protests. And when she crossed the border, she's into mainland China. She said, ah, finally, I can say whatever I want to say. And there's a real, irony there that she had to wait till she comes to the mainland to have real free speech because i can tell you the discussions on this side there were people who were supporting the protesters and they would have arguments with people here but it wouldn't descend into the chaos that we saw in hong kong but there i mean there was a real irony behind it all behind this idea of these people fighting for free speech while scaring people out of saying these things i mean you must have been getting a lot of messages from people saying you know what i can't do it myself you know thank you for doing it Yes. yes. So at one stage, I was getting a, a thousand messages a day uh, from Hong Kong people, uh, mostly parents saying, uh, you know, th this is being reported wrong. Someone needs to tell the truth. I mean, I remember one occasion I was standing outside. I was standing on a main street and people were setting fire 
to all the shops that might be Chinese. So there was a Chinese medicine shop. So I thought, ah, Chinese, fire to it. There was a mobile phone shop, which was called China Mobile. So despite the fact that it was all manned by Hong Kong people with a Hong Kong boss, set fire to it. Um, and like just attacking immigrant owned businesses uh, all the way down the high street. I mean, that was most, one of the most horrific things I ever saw. But there was something even more horrific. I then pick up my phone to see how it's being reported. And every single media has put a completely different spin on it. The spin is pro-democracy heroes are being harassed by evil Chinese. And it was like, it was the complete opposite of what was happening in front of my eyes. And uh, I just thought, okay, this story needs to be told. This is a very different story. And, you know, I don't need evidence or proof. It's right here, five yards ahead uh, in front of me. They were setting fire to shops, which had families living, uh, you know, deck after deck after deck after deck of families living above. I mean, how can you set fire to someone as a set fire to a shop as a political protest when there's so much danger involved and you know the the mainstream press is just not reporting that you know even a lot of the local papers were not reporting that so um uh, that's why the internet thank god became uh, our savior we could say these things on the internet if we couldn't get them into print you know i mean there were some reporters uh, who did a good job yeah. Uh, Western and uh, and Eastern, but uh, the majority, uh, unfortunately, took the mainstream line. Yeah, I mean, it was really, I mean, they weren't only burning down shops, they were burning down uh, opposition uh, or pro-establishment politicians' offices. These are people asking for political freedoms while burning down the offices of opposition. I, I remember there was... Opposition. Yeah, elected yeah. opposition officials, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. I remember. I think you did it. You, you wrote it was almost poetic, this thing about, you know, you can't say you're fighting for freedom while doing this. You can't. And it went viral. And that was actually the inspiration for one of one of my videos where okay. I, I, I added in some other examples because the, the, the hypocrisy was really um, was really absurd. And I remember there was this one famous uh, British guy. He, 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 he gained a lot of followers on Twitter. Um, he went by the handle Hong Kong Hermit. And he was like this, yeah, the, the this really awkward kind of a British guy, like is this freedom fighter. He called himself a super, uh, an Antifa super soldier. And what we you know when the when the protesters burnt down a bank um, or set fire to a bank that had the word Shanghai in it, and then after they found out that oh, actually this isn't owned by mainlanders, it's a Hong Kong local bank. And he came out to do, make an apology on his Twitter saying, you know, sometimes we're going to get this wrong and we're sorry we burnt this down. We didn't realize it was owned by uh, uh, Hong Kongers. It's like, hold on a second. How about sorry for burning down any business? Like, what, what, what he, like he's legitimizing this idea, you know, and, and he did the same thing with Molotov cocktails. The Molotov cocktail came too close to journalists instead of the police. Same thing. We're sorry. You know, some of these guys, they have bad aim. It's like, hold, hold on a second here. You're you're like if this was in the West, the police would be coming to you and saying, oh, what exactly are you telling these kids to do? I mean, it was it was really absurd. Of course, you know, Hong Kong Hermit was uh, was chased out of uh, Hong Kong by his own gang, by his own group. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a bit of a scandal him. there. I don't I don't know what's going on with that. But it, 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 if, if it's true, what they said about him, it would be pretty bad. But I don't want to I don't know, you know, how, how much that can be proven or not. But yeah, his own crew ended up uh, chasing him out afterwards of fellow uh, expats. Um, now, this uh, I, I'm seeing again, apologies if this is going all over the place, because I the next quote I have here is about the extradition bill, which is probably is a good place to start, because that is the excuse that was used to to bring this on. And it was I mean, most people didn't read the extradition bill. Most people didn't understand the extradition bill. Uh, the BBC's person, Stephen McDonald, who was in charge of covering it, was deliberately misrepresenting it. I confronted him about it. He said, point out where there are errors. I pointed out the errors and then he blocked me on Twitter afterwards for pointing out the errors like he asked me to. Um, I mean, it was very deliberate what they were doing. But you, yeah, you said, uh, I mean. I like the way that you summarized it in there uh, and talked about some of the absurdities. Like, for you know, you said, so um, I think you were quoting somebody here, or this might have been your own quote. A separate international law document said that extradition treaties were particularly necessary for places with shared borders, such as neighboring states. Otherwise, the most dangerous people on the planet could simply slip through a fence and escape, exactly as Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and Macau 
police had noted back in 1994. Um, there were other things um, that you pointed out that were quite interesting, the hypocrisy of European countries saying that Hong Kong shouldn't have an extradition bill with China when they not only have an extradition bill with China, they have actually extradited people back to China, and, but they're asking Hong Kong to be stuck with whatever criminals come over the border. Um, also, they have uh, extradition agreements with other states which have far worse uh, judicial systems than Hong Kong. Um, and right, the yeah. mechanisms El Salvador and Zimbabwe and, uh, you know, places, right. Brunei, places where they cut off limbs, you know, y uh, yeah, places yeah, where yeah, they yeah. stone gay people is fine. R but Hong Kong, China, no. Yeah, and the mechanisms, you, you made a point of this too, the mechanisms in place were far more robust than most people's, most places uh, extradition lie. They had to go through an a, extraneous process in Hong Kong. But I, I think the reason I highlighted this was because I saw how you explained it. I saw how you put point by point, this is what the extradition bill is. And it, it couldn't help me think that part of the blame, part of the problem here is the Hong Kong government just did a terrible job of selling the bill. Nobody's going to go through the bill to begin with, but at least they could have communicated it better. And I feel like maybe they felt like they didn't even need to communicate it, that, you know, this idea of a, of a, a murderer loose in Hong Kong uh, that needed to be sent back to Taiwan was reason enough to get people on board. And granted, maybe that's a, a, a valid thought. But at the end of the day, I feel like they did a really poor job of communicating this. I don't know what your thoughts, your thoughts are on that. Uh, yes, yes. Our Hong Kong government, uh, like the Chinese government, really, uh, are, are generally bad at explaining themselves, bad at PR. But they did have a, uh, a big enemy uh, working for the other side. Now, I think um, it, it became clear to me, and I didn't get this at first, but it became clear later, that one of the key principles in the, um, uh, the revolution industry handbook, which they were all using, is... Mm -hmm always piggyback on something real, a real grievance. So for example, in Thailand, they piggybacked on grievances against the king. Uh, in Hong Kong, they selected the extradition bill and piggybacked on top of it. Um, one of the big problems in Hong Kong was the fact that when a law is being discussed and it doesn't seem to be uh, going right, uh, you know, you, who do you turn to? You turn to the, the legal societies. But unfortunately, the legal so societies, especially the, the Hong Kong uh, barristers group, they've been taken over by a group of very, very over political pro West anti China people. Uh, and some of them were being were receiving cash for their uh, organizations. Um, from the infamous national, uh, from NED, from the yep. Na uh, National Endowment for Democracy. NED is the uh, destabilization unit set up by the CIA in the late 1980s when the CIA was being exposed all over the place by American journalists, among others. Uh, so they, they, they quieted down the CIA operations and started uh, NED to do the CIA's work. And Carl Grossman, I think it's probably worth mentioning, Carl Grossman, its co-founder, had said that what the CIA, he directly said what the CIA used to do covertly, they now do through the NED. But yeah. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. Clear so tape. Ned was sending bundles of cash to numerous Hong Kong groups, including groups uh, related very closely to the, uh, the barristers group here. And uh, so what did the barristers say? The barristers joined in on the attack and uh, basically didn't say... Um, no, you're getting it all wrong. You cannot. The extradition bill does not allow people to snatch the dissidents, the Democrats, and move them to China. Uh, in fact, the, the extradition bill is a, is a Western um, arranged uh, law that takes about two years and does people one at a time. And in fact, what the, the purpose of the bill is to offer more protection to defendants than the current deportation laws. So in fact, it was good for everybody. It was good for the people being deported as it was for the, the community in, uh, in general. Now the Hong Kong barristers should have stood up and said this. It was, it was the simple plain truth, uh, but they didn't. Uh, the international journalists should have said this, but they didn't. Uh, as you said earlier, nobody read the law. It was a good law. And it's still being right. used, in fact, there are law, law cases actually in uh, Hong Kong courts at this moment about extradition and they're, they're good laws, they're laws that, def, that help the deported get their rights.
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is something people should be equally concerned about with Hong Kong already having an extradition bill with the U.S. When you look at what they're doing to people like, you know, Meng Wanzhou and Julian Assange. I mean, we've got, <laughs> you know, the p people should be saying, hold, hold on a second. We, I think we should be worried by this, too. What if I decide to become a journalist who all of a sudden doesn't want to, you know, just slam China all the time and I want to start slamming America and uncovering their secrets? Well, we've got a pretty good example of what happens to you then. Um, right. I feel like people should yeah. be more concerned by, by, Let by me that. Let show you something that this is a, uh, this is a more uh, uh, evidence of the, uh, uh, the involvement of outsiders. Now here, uh, can you see this? This is a, um, this is a very, very nasty piece of work. And there were literally thousands upon thousands of these on the street. Now what they do is if you, if your car drives over it, it gets punctured. If your foot goes in, it goes right through your shoe. Uh, if a police dog goes on it, it's uh, it's disabled. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and I trod on one of these and it went right through my my shoe, right through my sock. Uh, it's my foot. Um, and, uh, you know, Hong Kong people are lovely people. Hong Kong students, I, I adore them. Um, they, they're great people. They're gentle people. They're intelligent people. They're, this is a very, very low crime society. The uh, approval rate of the Hong Kong police is like 80 percent or was 80 percent before all this madness started. Um, and they Hong Kong people are not the sort of people who will go off and spend uh, months of their time creating weapons that will harm people and animals they're just not those sort of people yeah. uh, so very very uh, harmful negative political influences were involved in hong kong uh, and you know i mean that's no longer in in doubt and uh, in the book uh, you know i name these specific groups that were right. involved and um you know, their their aim was to weaponize street protests. And that's not a quote from their critics. That's a quote from themselves. They said, we're here to weaponize street protests. Uh, right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I was. I, yeah. I was interviewed by Rania uh, not too long ago. Who you, you mentioned in your book, too. Um, and, and she when I was talking to her about uh, the Hong Kong protest, actually, she said she noticed a very similar thing all around the world, that that um, when these movements or color revolutions happen, they latch onto legitimate issues or they blow a legitimate issue out of proportion. And that's what they base it on. And, you know, I was kind of thinking as you were talking through this, you know, I criticized the, the, the Hong Kong government for not doing a better job of communicating. And I think there is some responsibility there, because, again, at, at the end of the day, this is going to end up being a propaganda war against propaganda. Uh, China mainland has less of this issue because they've got a firewall and they just say we're keeping this stuff out. But in Hong Kong, they realize it's an open society. We're going to have this propaganda co to contend with. We better up our game. But at the same time, Hong Kong is such a society where anybody who's lived there, they know that the system is just follows the rules. It's a rule following society. They cross the T's and dot the I's. So if you've got the other side that's working against you, who's willing to break all the rules, the rules of engagement, who's willing to pay people off and do all these things, these are places that the Hong Kong government can't go. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a... Um, uh, limitation there um, that they're working against. But mm -hmm. um, I have a, a quote here that I think will be, uh, it's a little bit of a different direction, but I think prefacing it first with a question to get your opinion on something is that I noticed um, across my friends in Hong Kong or different people that a lot of apolitical people or people who had slightly negative feelings towards China, this actually caused the opposite effect where it pushed them to become pro-China or at least more open-minded to China and suddenly reevaluating all the stories they heard about China because um, they were seeing on the ground how different reality is from how these mainstream media narratives um, uh, present the situation. So I, wa I wondered if you saw a similar shift in Hong Kong where all of a sudden, probably the opposite effect of what these outside forces were hoping, a lot of people became more pro-China or again, at least more open-minded to China. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. I saw thousands of these people. And uh, it's funny because the, 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 the middle ground, I mean, I, I'm in a good example. I was very anti-China and I believed all the terrible stuff that was said about China. Uh, but uh, when you see that, the, you know, the, the BBC uh, correspondents were, were simply not doing journalism, they're just doing sheer propaganda. And you think, wait, this is probably what they've always been doing. You realize oh my goodness, everything I've read about China, I need to take another look. And uh, 
it's funny, like yesterday, uh, in fact, about about once a week, but uh, yesterday was an example, someone will send me a quote from myself um, uh, that I said five years ago or 10 years ago and said, look what you said, now you're saying something different. And they do this as an attack. And I just laugh and I say, yes, that's right. That's what I believe then. This is what I believe now. Because wise people will uh, change their views when they get new evidence. You know, that's scientific thinking. That's modern thinking. That's critical thinking. You get new evidence, you revise your views. Uh, and um, so I'm not ashamed of what I believed then. And I'm not ashamed of what I believe now. My views you know, have evolved. You know, that's that's what yeah. people are supposed to do. You're supposed to change, uh, right? Absolutely. I remember that reminds me of a story. Uh, Aspie out of Australia, one of the nefarious kind of think tanks that is funded by the yeah. military industrial complex. They have one analyst that went after someone and they found out that this person who's pretty pro China now once attended a free Tibet protest. And they're like, aha, you see, you're such a fraud. And it's like, th this isn't the own you think it is. It's like, yes, I was completely fooled by all of these narratives. And now I've changed my mind. I mean, that's really telling that somebody thinks that that's a, a, a self own if you change your opinions and it shows mm -hmm. you and proves to you that actually these people are willing to admit that they're inflexible. They believe this now and they will always believe it no matter what you present to them. And um, I think um, one of the things I saw, and I want to ask you about this too, because uh, in, in, in your book, you say rechecking the details. So this is talking about when um, a, a kind of a baby step towards universal suffrage was being introduced uh, with pre-screened candidates to make sure they weren't like kind of separatists or anything like that. And you said, rechecking the details of that proposal, we now know that Hong Kong people were being offered full universal suffrage, one man, one vote system, with the simple provision that we uh, could have anyone except independent activists. So I'm, I'm, that's an important story that people leave out. But I wonder if that reflection, for you to go back and start saying, well, let me take a, a new look at this with this new set of you know glasses on now that I've kind of seen things from a different perspective. Would you say that that was an example of a re-evaluation that was born from your experiences in 2019? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. In fact, I was definitely one of the bad guys. I remember when the uh, when that dispute happened. Uh, just to uh, summarize it in in, in a paragraph, um, the uh, people like Reuters are saying that oh, the the pro democracy movement has been fighting for universal suffrage, and the government has been fighting against it. In fact, it was the opposite way around. The government had been working to introduce universal suffrage. They've been working on it for years. They've worked at all the steps, the legal steps. And uh, at the last minute, the, um, the requirement for an electoral, electoral committee to make sure that uh, the uh, uh, people who wanted to break up the country uh, were not uh, standing, um, that requirement caused a split. And I was on the wrong side of that. Um, I, uh, in fact, I dubbed that argument, um, they've turned universal suffrage into a choose your own puppet. And I made a <laughs> meme. That's, and a, went that's a good line, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I had a, a meme of, uh, of uh, you know, the Chinese leaders with puppet strings saying, choose which puppet, you know. And um, I used the slogan LMAO, you know, uh, with a picture of Mao. But anyway, so I was on the, the bad guy's side uh, uh, on that. But now looking back on it, uh, I was schooled by uh, political scientists from uh, Hong Kong U who said, uh, no, actually, every country in the world has the same requirement for you've got to be loyal to your country. It's not unusual. It's the default. Uh, right. Thought, oh, right. OK, I got that one wrong. But then, you know, I'm a journalist. I write every day. Uh, it means that I get lots right. of things wrong. I get thousands and thousands and thousands of things wrong. It's just right. The way we work. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are some other journalists, though, that they go. Um, it's not a matter of not kind of uh, getting a, a broad enough perspective or getting things wrong. There, there are some who um, deliberately set out to frame things um, using malicious ways. And, and, and one story that sticks out for me is that you mentioned a journalist who you know, there was a big story about him being expelled from uh, from Hong Kong because his visa was shortened or something like that, or he was given a shorter visa than usual. Yeah. But this was a guy who you knew personally who already planned to leave Hong Kong. He was yeah. going to move to Paris. 
And so he deliberately started going to these pro independents or getting, you know, pushing the limits, going past these boundaries to deliberately make this happen in order to make it into a story, uh, both to frame Hong Kong badly and maybe bring some fame to himself. So it seems like there's a lot of people, I don't know if you want to mention that a little bit more, but it seems like there's definitely a lot of malicious intent from some of these journalists. It's not just an innocent mistake. Yes, yes. Yes, I mean, to this day, if you look up Victor Mallet, Financial Times, you get these stories about this man being forced out of Hong Kong. And, um, you know, and I knew, and in fact, all the journalists knew because he never stopped talking about it, was that he would, he'd already packed his bags. And the reason why he was leaving Hong Kong was, uh, and couldn't and got visa problems on his way back in was because he, he was house hunting in Paris, you know. So the journalists knew the truth there, but wouldn't print it. So right. yeah, I, I mean, I don't think journalists are generally evil people. As a as a whole, they they get right. things wrong, they do things mm -hmm. too fast, they they look through their Western lens, they're they're trapped in this mindset. So I, I, in general, they're not evil people, but there are certain cases where they do deliberately hide the truth and that's uh, uh and that's unfortunate uh, right yeah, yeah the, 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 this, yeah. yeah this way the way that they frame these things i, I think it's something uh, it's a really creative tactic and I, I think i don't know if you've noticed i've seen a similar kind of thing going on now so you know when when people are applying for these uh, uh, pro-democracy rallies or the the tiananmen square vigil and stuff like that and the permits are declined mm -hmm. um they're saying you see this is hong kong you know uh, cracking down on these uh, the freedoms of pro-democracy activists and um then I, I i wanted to dig a bit deeper i asked i said well are any pro-establishment rallies being declined and i found out no they're not being declined well why is that that sounds that seems a little bit fishy and it's like because they come to us with their proposal and we say because of the covid situation you know we're not really approving any and they don't push it any further they know they say okay well it doesn't make any sense to continually push this or take this to the courts because that's a pretty valid reason but these other groups they know that they'll never get it through and they want to turn it into this cracking down on democracy thing so they push it to a stage where they know they already know the answer they already know the situation with the pandemic right. But it's um, yeah. It, Actually, it, there was a good example of that just a couple of weeks ago. There was a, an article in the in the South China Morning Press and lots of papers saying um, a uh, a filmmaker who was known to be pro democracy. Uh, you know, the police. He was doing a private screening of a, of one of his movies, and the police came in, raided it, and uh, and uh, charged them with. Uh, um, breaking the COVID uh, separation, social distancing rules. And so there are all these articles on it all over the place. But um, nobody mentioned the fact that there were, in fact, uh, like 159 other places also raided and also had people uh, right. castigated for breaking rules. So if you take out the 159 others and just mention one, it sounds like Oh, the Hong Kong government, the, the, the authorities are being so heavy handed. But in fact, they were just doing what good COVID fighting bodies do. Uh, so right. again, completely misrepresenting the situation. And you multiply that by every day, several articles, mm -hmm. by the entire global media. And then you realize, wow, the scale of this scam is unbelievable. Right. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, it, 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 it's such a, a really easy way to mislead people mm -hmm. um, into believing a specific narrative. I mean, you were saying also, I have another quote here from and from the book saying, you know, by 2019, Hong Kong had uh, quite literally become one of the best governed, most law abiding places in the world. And, you know, you were talking about the um, the impression of the Hong Kong police, one of the highest approval ratings by Western standards, by Western standards, by the Cato Institute. They did a study showing that, you know, Hong Kong was the third freest place on earth. According to measurable studies, the U S was number 17 and they were coming to bring freedom to, to Hong Kong. I mean, it was, uh, it was quite remarkable and absurd how people could go from one extreme to the other so easily with just the right amount of propaganda, the right amount of coverage. Um, I mean, I, it, it, I mean, that was probably part of the reason also that, that got you to say, this is just absurd. I have to write about it. At least it was one of the things for me. Right. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the uh, the uh, reality is hilarious. So, I mean, people, visitors would come to Hong Kong and say, hmm, this is strange. This feels like the freest democracy I've ever been in and yet without the crime. So how did you do this? So, uh, in fact, people should 
have been saying, okay, Hong Kong got something special here. It's got uh, free press, but uh, very low crime. Uh, you know, how did you do it? How can we learn from it? Uh, instead, we we never that view was never presented, which is a uh, which is a shame, really. I mean, there's so many lessons here that uh, could be helpful to to people around the world. And of course, COVID is the ultimate example. Uh, it's just it's insane that people, the world's press is not looking at Hong Kong, looking at China and saying, wow, zero COVID so quickly and multiple times. And you even defeated Delta. Okay, we need to learn fr uh, from you so that we can save lives. We can save hundreds of thousands of lives. But instead it was sort of like, oh, no, 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 no. They're, they're, they're different, they're Chinese. You know, yes, yes, this is a story we will not cover. I mean, by choosing not to cover um, what the successes of, of, of mainland China and Hong Kong, uh, they're condemning their people to death, literally condemning their people to death. Yeah, I mean, I think it probably works in reverse, too, in terms of people in Hong Kong, that it's important that they learn um, uh, particularly the, the the minority that was radicalized, that they learn a little bit about the rest of the world too and the way that other people do things because it wouldn't then it would lead to people not saying silly things like you mentioned in your book about the guy saying, I wish our free press was like Singapore's. And it's like, oh, wait, <laughs> ho, ho, hold on a second. No, <laughs> Hong Kong's press is way more free than that. But, <laughs> you know, there was, um, I, I want to talk about some of the control mechanisms that go into controlling this narrative and massaging this narrative into um, a certain direction. So on the social side, on the ground level, you know, people policing people almost, um, you, you have a quote here that, that really hones in on that. You say, um, it, I'll, I'll finish after you were talking about people trying to prevent present the truth you're saying yet few people dare to try to set the record straight if you did try to correct the errors you were at best labeled a communist party puppet or at worst have your face address phone number and family tree published on the internet for purposes of abuse by a fast-growing group of angry panicking violent people um and you also mentioned ronnie tong also as a, as a good example of trying to set the record straight and just getting attacked like you get the the you, society was getting um worked up uh mm -hmm around anybody trying to present anything other than this mainstream media narrative that was being fed to everybody. Yeah. One of the funniest examples was uh, I, w one day I, I went to, you know, I dressed, uh, you know, trying to look discreet, dressed in sort of dark clothes and got my camera and <laughs> um, sneaked into a protest. But unfortunately, uh, I'd come in through a sort of alleyway around the back of this protest. I was trying to get in the middle. And I, and I did. I managed to get right in the middle of it. And unfortunately, this protest was uh, was not really a protest. It was a it was a battle. White shirts versus black shirts. And there was a, like a huge ring of black shirts uh, around the edges. And there was a group of white shirts in the middle. And I'd come into the middle of the white shirts, you know, wearing wearing all black. So I thought, oh, no. So I ran around trying to find a clothes shop so I could just buy something that wasn't black and stick it over my head. And all the shops were like pulling down their shutters, <laughs> expecting violence. So um, I just thought, oh, no, I'm going to get killed here. And then people were starting to look at me. Eventually, uh, I remember there was a logo on the back of my T-shirt. So I pulled it off and put it on uh, back to front. So there were some colors. And then I bought a load of shopping, which I held. So, uh, so now I just look like a ditzy old brown guy doing his shopping. Uh, so... Um, then, then I, you know, uh, then I joined the protest, and this was the first time I've been on the what they call the gangsters' side instead of the uh, uh, the, the protesters' side. I've always been embedded with the protesters, and uh, it was uh, it was very interesting. I mean, the, the gangsters are so misrepresented. There are there are like forty different triad groups in Hong Kong, and maybe about seven of them are organised in a military way, and maybe three of them are actually violent. Uh, some of them are like just like old men's benevolent societies. You know? So they're very different range of people who are labeled gangsters or labeled triads. And so I spent a, a very interesting couple of hours uh, with these uh, guys getting their point of view. And um, they, uh, so again, it was sort of like, okay, on all sides, this is being simplified and misrepresented. I think one of the issues is that, you know, Hong Kong uh, journalists generally, they, they, they get a point of view, they get a storyline, a narrative, and they just run with it and then they feed it. 
And it's right. not necessarily the correct storyline or the best storyline. It might even be completely wrong, but it doesn't matter. Once they've got that narrative, they run with it and they keep finding stories to feed it and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And the real story gets completely lost. As a, as right. A... Yeah. That, that was an interesting part in your book, talking about the dynamics of these groups. Um these triads that some of them are just basically neighborhood watch groups. I think retelling the story um, in the correct way of what happened in Yenlong was really important also. I mean, it doesn't excuse what the white shirts did, but it's really remarkable at how that was framed. You know, when you looked at all those videos that were cut out of, you know, sh showing, um, you know, spraying the fire extinguisher at the white shirts who were just basically trying to block them from coming out of the station, which is, again, not within their rights, but throwing stuff at them, dropping stuff on their heads. All of those videos were cut out when they went through the uh, in, into the international media or the uh, almost comical scene you were talking about, about the triads trying to rip open the gate while the uh, black shirt protesters are taunting them and poking them with umbrellas. Then finally they manage to get it loose and it's just mm -hmm. they, they look on their faces, uh-oh, and they turn around and run. Um, yeah, yeah. There, is something, there is something humorous about that, but all of that, all of that mm -hmm. was cut out. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it really, I almost feel like there should be, and, and I, I would totally work on this with you too, to accompany your book, a list or a website that puts all of those videos you were talking about, about right. how the first 10 seconds were cut out or the framing was different. And we just put them in there because I, I feel like your book is not a surprise to me, the stories in there, because I was following it. I saw it and, 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 and saw the truth. But to a lot of people who never saw any of this stuff happen, I, I feel like for some of them, it'll just be too much. They'll be reading the book and they'll be like, nah, there's no way. I mean, how could reality be this different from what was presented to me? But it, but it really was. Um, but before, before we move on, I actually want to hone in on one point. You, Because there's these continual stories of the book, of you walking into these protests, getting out of the car and saying, I got to see what's going on. This is this is where the Indiana Jones part comes in, because, you know, <laughs> in terms of even speaking out, I honestly I don't know if I would have done what I did if I was living in Hong Kong. I felt safe in Shenzhen doing it. I went on to hit lists. Also, I was in telegram groups with 17000 people. You know, there was one guy posting pictures of my kids, like saying, oh, I hope your kids are doing well and stuff like that. I'm like, Jesus, you know, I, it really struck me as what my friends in Hong Kong were talking about, saying why they couldn't speak up. Mm -hmm. But you you're on the hit lists also. Your face went on their websites also. Not only are you speaking up, you're running into these protests to say, I got to see what's going on. I just can't. Um, I, I, I'm trying to imagine what your wife is thinking and saying. I can't imagine she would have been too pleased with you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. I'll, I'll be sure not to put you in touch with her because she said exactly the same thing. But yeah, I, I mean, one of the advantages of being uh, being old and stupid is that uh, you know nobody can destroy my career because you know most of it's past me but um i did one really stupid thing once uh, um i was there taking pictures just with my phone and um the uh, the call went up where all cameras had to be put down because they were starting to break the law so what happened is that they would pose with their with their uh, their, their banners and things and it was fine and then they ordered all the journalists to put down the cameras and they would start uh, start fires and start uh, pulling up the railings and, and spray painting everything. And um, I didn't stop, of course. I thought, okay, and then they're going to order me around. So I kept uh, uh, shooting. And then they surrounded me and they got my phone and they said, uh, we want you to delete all your pictures. So I, I sat there and I, I deleted the pictures I'd taken. And then they let me go. And then, um, of course, I walked 10 steps and uh, and pressed recover, deleted, recently deleted, and then recover. And boom, all the pictures came straight back. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was thinking, wow, I'm so clever. But of course, I wasn't clever because the next thing I did was put this whole anecdote on the internet saying, and then I recovered all the pictures. Oh boy, don't these guys realize that you can press recently deleted and you can press recover all? You know, so I put this in on the internet and then boy, did I get hate after that. So that's when it got really, uh, really unpleasant. So, um, uh, yeah, so it takes it takes courage or stupidity. 
and it's a thin line. <laughs> or a mix of both. It's not even a line; it's an overlap, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You, that that story is quick. That overlap. <laughs> Do you recall on that day when they were telling you, "Okay, everybody, put their put your phones down"? Were there a Western journalist there also who just complied and put put them down? Or, or that particular day, do you recall? Uh, yeah, I mean, they were mostly mostly locals, uh, but um, yeah, the Western journalists, um, they often what they would do would they they would show that they were friendly, and they would uh, sometimes the guys would pose for them throwing a throwing a bomb or whatever. Um, so they knew that the Western journalists would always tell their side. You know, they were. There, there were one or two. There was one Australian journalist uh, who who worked very hard to to tell both sides of the story. Uh, but yeah, the ones who told both sides were were a handful. Most of them uh, just would obey the protesters. Yeah. That was the one who caught uh, one of the one of the actresses or singers getting beaten up in the street, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. I remember that. And he was like shocked. He was like, I can't believe these are the you know freedom fighters or whatever it is yeah um and and some of them got even there was one journalist i don't know if you remember the photographer when there was an angry mob going after a guy who was speaking mandarin chinese the jp morgan employee right. um and he wanted to leave he wanted to go into his office building and he actually got in front of him and closed the door so that he couldn't mm -hmm. get in and then finally the mob one guy came and started you punching his face in I don't know if you remember that, but there were instances of journalists even getting involved to facilitate uh, yeah. the, 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 the violence. Yes. I mean, I spoke to, yeah, there was a guy called Marcus, a Swiss guy. Uh, I did speak to him. Uh, and, uh, you know, his point of view was that he wasn't really thinking and he just wanted to get in front of him. And that caused him to close the door, but he wasn't deliberately trying to, to stop him. I mean, uh -huh. M M Marcus uh, suffered a lot for that. He... Uh, you know, they, they brought a lawsuit against him and uh, uh, he he regretted that moment, I'm, I'm sure, well, for the rest of his life. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Western media did not cover itself with glory. Uh, uh, the other thing I was disappointed about was there was 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 the church. I come from a religious background mm -hmm. and um, the churches, uh, some of them tried to, to, to stay away from the violence and some of them just dived in in, a, in, a, in an awful way. I mean, like. There were so many Christian groups marching, saying that um, a new law will um, bring the death penalty to Hong Kong. And I actually had the law on my phone. I said, no, nope, look at this, read this. And the new law, it especially says um, all death penalty uh, cases automatically are rejected by the new law. Uh, and, you know, and I'd say, well, what do you say about this? And they would just uh, retreat into generalized prejudice. You know, right. If the facts defeat you, retreat into generalized prejudice and say, oh, well, the Chinese, they don't follow their rules anyway, do they? So, yeah. So that was a real. Yeah. No, it, it was really hard to get through to certain people. About religion, though, I don't know if you remember, because this was interesting to me, too. Um, there there was the, the event where the mosque was sprayed uh, with uh, the water cannon uh, with uh, with colored um, uh a colored spray which obviously wasn't deliberate but the thing that was remarkable for me was then they the protesters wanted to use this as an opportunity to show oh we stand with the you know south asian community and you know uh the the muslims and they came with like toothbrushes and they were scrubbing the gates and stuff like that showing oh look at us we're the good guys but it wasn't even you know days or a couple of weeks before that when Jimmy Sham was attacked, I'll say attacked because there's a lot of stuff that that makes mm -hmm. that look like it was a completely fabricated stunt, uh, which mm -hmm. served him very well in the in the elections. But that's a story that people can look up on their own. I've covered it. Um, but he implicated um, South Asian uh, attackers. He says it was South Asian attackers or I can't remember if he said people from India or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, when uh, and saying it, that was who attacked him. And after that happened. The community, the entire community was like under attack. They were getting threats. They were getting the mosque, the people who, you know, Muslims were getting death threats. And some of the communities even arranged a giveaway to give away free water and free snacks to protesters to, to try to calm them down and make amends with them. I don't know if you remember all of that. So it's just like they were attacking this group. And all of a sudden they're like, there's an opportunity here. There was some spray that hit the mosque. We're going to show them how much better we are than everybody else. I don't know if you remember that that unfolding yeah. or what your yeah. perspective is from somebody that's kind of from that that, that, that right. community. Yeah, and in fact, the the the, uh, the the following rally was a stand with the brown people rally. 
and it was great because so they 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 saying that the the, uh, the Muslims and the Hindus are also being attacked by these dreadful people, uh, dreadful Chinese uh, uh, invaders. So we stand, the protesters stand with the Muslims and the and the Hindus, and uh, it was great. No, no brown people turned out. I couldn't see a single brown person except myself, uh, and I was there to 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 study it, not to not to take right. part. So, yeah, yeah brown exactly. people were pretty wise to stay to 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 keep detached, you know. Right. You know, yeah. Buddhists also Buddhists are supposed to stay detached, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, continuing on to the the control mechanisms for helping to control this narrative and and shape it in a certain uh, direction, I like the point that you uh, um, talked about because this really is something that makes people self regulate. Um, and you say in the book, if you ever uh, hint in print that foreign forces are involved, you're instantly buried alive by pieces of hate mail telling you that you are a paid Communist Party official pushing a Beijing talking point and are canceled as a, a credible source. Or they just, you know, call you a conspiracy theorist or saying, oh, everything's about the CIA. Well, you know, first of all, I'm sorry, they do have operations all around the world. I mean, these documents, many of them are declassified. And we've got literal examples like the, the Open Technology Fund was funding tools for the protesters. The NED literally has on their site the funding that goes into Hong Kong. Um, you had the Spark Alliance Hong Kong uh, bank account that was uh, seized, that was that were funding these protesters or were implicated in all of this, too. I mean, these were legitimate things, but that's a really good social mechanism to just say you're a crazy person or you're a CCP shill or in, in the face of so many facts. That was just mm -hmm. a place that you couldn't go. And I even found myself regulating. I didn't want to talk about that too much because it's just too much for people to digest, even though, like I said, all the evidence is there and you've got plenty of it in your book as well. Yeah. 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 There's, um, there's the NED, uh, pouring in money. And like, uh, at the moment, a lot of these unions are being disbanded. Uh, and one of them, the Confederation of Trade Unions, uh, I mean, here's a, here's a, here's a scoopette, I guess. Um, Confederation of Trade Unions is currently in the news a lot because they're being disbanded because that, you know, because the, the oppressiveness of, of the Hong Kong government, in fact, um, they've been funded by the NED since uh, at least 1994. We looked up the uh, the accounts from the American side, and uh, what happens is that the the NED, which is the CIA destabilization body spin-off, uh, passes money to a union group, which passes money to another union group, which passes money to the Confederation of Trade Unions. So, um, as William uh, Bloom, the journalist, the historian, said. Uh, the NED is basically a money laundering scheme. Uh, it takes taxpayers' money from uh, the taxpayer and filters it through various groups and sends it to destabilization units. And it's interesting, some of the accounts for the Confederation of Trade Unions specify what the money is to be used for. And it's not trade union activities, it's to be a rallying point for activists. So they're actually saying, use this money to... To, to provide uh, services for anti-government people. Uh, that's the purpose of it. That's there in the accounts, you know. Right. So it's not an allegation or anything. It's, it's specified, use this money for this. Um, and, yeah, yeah. And, and the way that plays it out onto the ground in terms of the things you see, um, it's quite funny also when you point out, you know, people, you know, saying Trump, come and save us or, you know, <laughs> save our constitution when Hong Kong doesn't even have a constitution. It's like these people, you know, who are involved in this clearly have no idea about what how Hong Kong works. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, that was a that was a really funny one. So we were outside the U.S. consulate and they're handing out all these banners which say defend our constitution. And, you know, the local reporters say, what? This is proof here that uh, that this whole thing is being manipulated and all the foreign journalists are there with their cameras sort of like they don't get it of course they've not done their homework they don't realize this you know they just assume well everyone's got a constitution right so yeah that was a yeah. hilarious moment no absolutely um the other control mechanism uh, that helped shape the international uh, uh, opinion on Hong Kong were the social media mechanisms. Uh, throughout that protest, there were multiple sweeps of so-called bot accounts. Mm -hmm. And um, they were only people who were uh, pro-China, so to speak, or who were not even pro-China, just giving the other side of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and there were real people mixed up in there. I know some of those so-called bots. They were like, they sent me a WeChat message saying, apparently I'm a bot. I just got removed, you know? Um, 
And what's interesting is even if they were using mechanisms to say that, you know, if people were sharing articles and then, you know, sharing it in a group and then people boosted it by all retweeting it together or something like that, even if they say were saying that was the reason that, you know, they, they were looking for this behavior, there were literally groups with tens of thousands of these protesters who had daily tasks that they were sending out saying retweet this, bump this story, but none of them were ever affected. So, um, I think probably the most dangerous example of that was when you were talking about the student who fell in the garage, uh, the, the parkour guy who fell, um, died, and people wanted to pin it on the police and people were outraged about that. And the people who were bringing nuance to the discussion were saying, hold on a second, because obviously the, the, the footage was eventually released for the parking garage also. They were silenced also, or they were removed, or they were suspended. And that is probably the most dangerous time that was happening because whoever wanted to see disruption in Hong Kong could see this could be a major flashpoint. These people are angry that somebody died and they want revenge. It seems like that would be the most important time to start ramping up censorship. And it looks like that's exactly what happened. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on the whole social media mechanisms that went into this or the things that you saw happen. Uh, yes, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very serious problem, exactly as you say. Uh, there are organized groups who are reporting your posts, uh, I know for a fact, and reporting my posts and uh, getting them, getting us silenced. Uh, so, um, but what can we do? I mean, Twitter is, you know, one of the Twitter principles is to, uh, to, to delete stuff that attacks NATO values. NATO values, I mean, NATO values, you know, I mean, just like, the sheer irony in that phrase. So, um, yeah, so we can't get the truth. We can't get the truth out there. Uh, it's, it's probably uh, worth mentioning that one of the major uh, groups that help these social media outlets censor their content is the Atlantic Council, which is funded by NATO also. I mean, it, it's absolutely absurd. Yes. Um, and you mentioned Aspie, Aspie in Australia, which is, of course, yeah. uh, funded by mostly by by, by US uh, military sources. So basically, a lot of this is to do with weapons sales. I mean, it's terrible. All this misery, all this harm, all this hate is one of the fundamental themes of it is is power. But a major part of it is is weapon sales. Uh, which is yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess it's double. It yeah, because like Aspie, you know, they, they're not only funded by the uh, military industrial complex, private arms uh, manufacturers, they're also funded by the U.S. State Department. So you can be sure that some of the U.S. foreign policy talking points are going to make it through. And the U.S. doesn't want to see China continuing to rise. They don't want to they don't want to see, you know, China um, continuing to displace Western corporations in the uh, global south. Um, where they previously had monopolistic control over. I mean, we can look throughout history. The U.S. literally deploys their military to protect the U.S. corporate interests, whether it be, you know, overthrowing the Iranian government for, you know, BP, um, whether it be, um, uh, there were a few other examples. I mean, even from the beginning of history, they wanted these uh, U.S. corporations to go and scrape guano off of islands that didn't belong to them, uh, that belong to uh, South American countries. And the, mili they would ha the military said, we'll support you. We'll come and protect you while you do this. The entire history of the U.S. was uh, uh, kind of built on this or, you know, overthrowing governments that want to uh, 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 socialize their natural resources. So, I mean, there's plenty there's plenty of geopolitical um, incentive for the U.S. to want to push these narratives also. Um, I guess the other aspect of that was the uh, the general media misrepresentation. And this is the interesting part, because, I mean, you say that, yeah, of course, and I agree with you, you know, journalists aren't innately, you know, uh, evil, but I almost think Back to, and you quote Noam Chomsky in your book at one point also in regards to you don't really stand for free speech if you don't stand for the free speech of the people you despise the most as well. But on another aspect, I remember him talking to a journalist uh, and, and the journalist asked him, how do you know that I'm self-censoring? And he says, I'm not saying you self-censor. I'm sure you believe everything you're saying, but if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. And I, I wonder if that plays it into it, that uh, people with a certain opinion, the correct opinion are cultivated and promoted throughout these organizations. Because when you see what was going on on the ground, you see with your own eyes that journalists, Western journalists are also seeing the same thing as you. When you see, when you read the extradition bill yourself and you see what is what it's finally translated to in their reports, I, I mean, 
I, I personally, I can't imagine anything other than deliberate malicious intent in terms of the people that are that were involved in the in, in reporting the Hong Kong story. At least, I don't know what your 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 yes. thoughts and feelings are on that. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Some are some are lazy, and there is some uh, malicious intent there. That, that's that's very clear. Uh, but I had a couple of very interesting conversations with Eric Lee. Do you know Eric Shun Lee? Oh yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He's great. Yeah, and uh, he taught me a really good lesson on this. He said. Um, the, that uh, ultimately uh, the Western press is working night and day, 24 hours a day to destroy its own credibility. And um, uh, bit by bit, people will look around and see the world as it is and then see the world uh, as the BBC reports and realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it's frustrating for us at the moment. But right. bit by bit, it's the credibility is being destroyed. And then we see the rise of the independent media, the independent voices, the citizen journalists. And, and you're probably one of the best examples of that I know, who is just fearless and will just uh, speak the difficult truths. And people will say, yes, finally, somebody's saying that. So as the rise of independent journalists, citizen journalists, social media, uh, social media from multiple different platforms uh, rises, um then you know the truth will will out eventually so um the... it, it, you know what the way these let's engage with us um, should further discredit them also um you know because obviously i think these mainstream media outlets see this move towards these independent journalists and that's a threat to them now personally mm -hmm. this isn't a matter of them just you know parroting their empire's desires now this is something that's personally threatening them and you'll notice when they engage so i've been i've been featured in uh, al jazeera the uh, scmp has come after me also and what these people do uh, who are going with a specific narrative is when they interview people who agree with the uh, general consensus, mainstream media consensus, they'll ask them meaningful questions about their work. They'll ask them, OK, so, yeah, how do you come to this conclusion? What do you think will happen next? But when they reach out to people like me um, and there, there are many who are speaking out now, they, they ask questions like, what does it feel like to be a, 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 a mouthpiece for Beijing? Or, you know, these really super superficial questions. It's like, hold, hold on a second. How about you engage with some of my actual positions and arguments? Um, but uh, going into that malicious um, intent angle also for because even if even if it's a small section of it, I think it's important enough to let people know that this exists. I mean, you, you exposed one of the. Um, the journalist in Hong Kong uh, or bloggers, I don't know how you describe him, who was working under um, under a false oh. name and pretending that he was born in Hong Kong and that he spoke for the Hong Kong people. And you, it was uncovered that he wasn't. And for even exposing that, for even talking about that, the Hong Kong Free Press wanted to come after you. And I, I don't know if you want to mention that story a little bit, because I think that is an example of deliberate malicious intent. Yes, 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 that was a good example, yes. So Hong Kong people came to me and said, uh, you know, one of the loudest pro uh, protest of voices is actually a, a, a guailo in disguise as a, as, a, as a locally born person. And uh, I was baffled at first, and, and they said, uh, and these people, they weren't even on the sort of pro-China side, they were just fairly balanced people, and they just said, they, we feel it's wrong. And in fact, this... This guy, uh, his his uh, written name was was Kong, uh, Kong Changgan, and he was like the chief reporter for for um, the Hong Kong Free Press. His articles were everywhere, and if you got a subscription to the Hong Kong Free Press, you got one of his books free. His name was just everywhere on that website, and uh, had been for many years. And he gave interviews to to all the big media. You know, the, 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 the he was quoted in the New York Times and the Guardian and the. Uh, France 24 and DW and uh, AFP and all, all the all the major media, Washington Post. And yet, you know, he was a blonde guy called Brian from from Lama Island, uh, who's a Louisiana resident uh, who, who spent a few years here pretending to be locally born. Working for Amnesty International before also, who, by the way, was yeah. integral in propping up um, the Nyira testimony, the fake Nyira testimony in the 90s, you know. Um, oh, right. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. yeah. 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 I think with Hong Kong Free Press, actually, there's probably a story worth mentioning also. I, I, I'm sure you must know it, um, which was when there was a Canadian vlogger who came to um, oh, yeah. came to Hong Kong, Toby Gu. Yeah. yeah right. And he recorded. He actually came with the intention to record Hong Kong police brutality. And what he found completely shocked him. He found protesters beating the 
heck out of innocent people, beating the heck out of people who just disagreed with them or had a different viewpoint. And he captured some pretty, pretty brutal stuff. And when he posted it, he was he, he was under attack. People were coming after him. They wanted to find him for exposing this. And what Tom Grundy did, the uh, I guess he's the co-founder of Hong Kong Free Press. Um, you know, he posted his picture when he was already in hiding in his hotel and said, this guy is is pretending to be a journalist and he's affecting our credibility and all of this stuff. Confront him. You know, really? after he's uh, yeah, yeah, he posted that. I continually yeah. bring it up. It, Tom Grundy blocked me after I, I brought that out because it is shocking, like calling oh, yeah. on violent people who he caught and he's already yeah. hiding in his hotel. And Tom Grundy says, confront this person. He's putting on a, a journalist vest up until this point. Tom Grundy had no issue with the people putting on journalist vests who were because there were hundreds mm -hmm. of fake journalists in the streets. They were they were uh, jour people with journalist vests holding on to police officers while they were trying to make arrests. There's footage of this. Mm -hmm. He had no problem with that. He only had a problem when a guy, an ordinary guy, came over from Canada and recorded something that was a regular scene. We know how much violence there was from these protesters that the Hong Kong Free Press continually refused to cover in any meaningful way. That's when he got angry, when the narrative was affected mm -hmm. by this guy wearing a fake press vest. I thought it was outrageous. I don't know if you knew the full extent of that story or, or what Tom mm -hmm. Grundy did there. But that, again, is why I have this this need to say there's a lot of malicious actors involved in this entire situation. Yes. One of the Hong Kong Free Press uh, columnists, a guy called Tim Hamlet, apparently wrote an article about, about me saying that, uh, look, he's a China Daily writer and uh, quoted a piece uh, that I've written that was in the China Daily. In fact, you know, I'm a freelance reporter. That piece uh, first appeared in an American publication, American newsletter. Then uh, the China Daily printed it, European uh, sources printed it, it was translated into Spanish. This is how this is how journalists work. You know, we print, we, we sell things multiple times, we have to, to make a living. Um, but no, he just zoomed in. You know, he didn't have the courtesy to actually call me and say, so you wrote this specially for the China Daily? Or do you work there? Or, you know, he just didn't check his facts, you know. Um, right. Yeah, a lot of people told me to reply to that, but I, uh, but I didn't because, uh, you know, as Eric Lee says, um, eventually what will happen is that you, people will judge by the outcome. So, um, so X country will pretend to be very well governed and democratic, but you know, six hundred thousand of their people will die of bad governance or COVID. Uh, another country will be labelled as evil, but in fact will. Uh, rescue their people from poverty and so right. people will judge by outcomes not by labels and right. i think that's what's happening that gives me hope anyway it gives me hope yeah this part i think i think it's really important to think about how we can turn these into lasting lessons because um although you know people in hong kong on the ground saw for themselves the difference between reality and how mainstream media um presents things i have a good friend in australia uh, uh jack james who's doing a deep dive on Western media propaganda. And she, I think she coined it herself. I don't know if it was an existing phrase, but she talked about the page turning effect. Like she'll read a newspaper and she'll see an article that is within her area of expertise and say, hmm, that is completely fabricated. I know that because I know about this subject. But then she turns the page and reads a story in the same mag in the same newspaper about something she doesn't know about and says, oh, wow, that's shocking. That's really interesting and just takes it as face value. So I really feel like, uh, first of all, the people in Hong Kong need to make sure that they're, they don't, they're not affected by this page turning effect. When all of a sudden there's narratives, and I've made sure to actively do this as well, as well. when there's narratives about Syria or Israel or Iran or things like that, you got to force yourself to remember and say, hold on a second. I know how this thing plays out. Let me try to see if I can search for the, you know, the Nuri Vitachi of uh, Syria, who is saying the things that are discouraged from being said, who is not lining up with the mainstream media. I, I, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like this is really important for us to keep in mind. And I don't know. I don't know if it plays into the way you think about international media now. And if it also, you know, adds a level of skepticism that wasn't there before when you're viewing events that are outside of your own area of knowledge. Uh, yes, uh, de de definitely true. But I think it does. I think a little we're all becoming a bit more 
uh, we all have a bit of healthy skepticism. I mean, we don't want to be cynical, but we do want right. to have a little healthy skepticism, and, and that grows. But um, one of the problems is that uh, because the Western media is so dominant, 90% of international news comes from, from NATO. Uh, you know, it's so dominant. Um, we have to take different routes. So, so for example, my new project, uh, FridayEveryday.com, I've got a lovely little team of people here uh, working on that. Um, we're taking a different route, basically, in that we're focusing mainly on things like Chinese culture, uh, because we're, we're sort of saying, OK, political wars are exhausting and difficult and emotional and create anger. Uh, let's look at tourism in Xinjiang, for example. And uh, so one of our guys looked at tourism in, in Xinjiang and found the number of visitors was astonishing, was higher than uh, in France. Uh, so we take different routes like that. So um, Chinese. I, I like that article. Yeah, yeah. that was good. I, I reshared that on my Twitter and it was quite popular. And oh, I like the way, yeah, I like the way it was framed because it was just basic factual. You mentioned the controversies also, because obviously you can't talk about Xinjiang without talking about that, but it was very factual and there's very little to disagree with. It's just, here are the facts. And it's interesting to see the reactions. Like for example, people saying, well, you know what? It's just local visitors, it's local Chinese visitors. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's not worth responding to because it's still by numbers, people are going there for visiting. and. It, it unravels a whole bunch of other um, possible implications to show how people think, like saying, OK, well, does that mean you think that all Chinese people are in on this little secret that there's something terrible going in on Xinjiang? <laughs> in Xinjiang? If Chinese people go and see it for those themselves, that doesn't count because they're Chinese. And, and it, it kind of makes me think of the, you know, when the 20 something countries condemned China in the UN for their treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, there were 50 countries, even more countries, mostly Muslim countries saying, well, mm -hmm. actually, we know that we, we, we visited and we see the situation and we're actually approve of what they're doing. And they're following all necessary human rights. Mm -hmm. People then say, who were just moments ago pretending to care about Muslims say, well, they're corrupt Muslim countries, you know, saying this. Mm. So it's like, well, hold on a second. You know, <laughs> uh, it really is revealing to see how uh, I like I like the first of all, the way your articles are structured and then seeing how people who are hell bent on thinking about things a certain way are going to process it and <laughs> try to negate just core facts. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's, that, it's really, interesting. Yes. In regards to that, I'd like to give you an invitation in that we we, we want to launch a, a, a nuance project. And I think you'd be great for this. So basically, uh, you know, things get polarized. So we've got one group saying um, uh, in Xinjiang, it's rape and murder and genocide on an industrial scale. I mean, it's very extreme, the BBC type view. And then we've got the, the, the China state me media saying no, everybody's dancing all the time. Happy, 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 studying <laughs> Mandarin. Happy, happy, happy. And then there's you and me. And uh, we look for the nuance and say, look, the Chinese officials, they can be heavy handed. Uh, yes, they're going to be very watchful uh, on, on, on Uyghurs because of the, the ETIM, the terrorists. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, no, they're not. It's not genocide and mass murder. OK, so in the middle, there's that nuance portion, which I think you and I are in saying we know the Chinese can be heavy handed, but no, there's no genocide. And so so um, so let's let's fight for nuance. Yeah, so absolutely. I, I think there needs to be more of that. You know, I was invited a couple of times by um, Chinese state media recently to go on a trip to Xinjiang with them. Hmm. And uh, I refused every time I said, you know, the only way I'm going to do this is that. Uh, because I said, I don't agree with everything that you do, all of your policies and how you do it. I want to be able to talk about some of these things. And if we're going to do that, then fine. Um, if not, I'm not I'm not I'm not interested. I went on a trip with um, with them to Tibet once and uh, it was really eye opening. Um, I think a lot of the journalists want to be a little bit more open minded, but they, they're just kind of afraid to 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 try new things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there might be opening up a little bit. I've got a few people because con I'm contacted all the time by Chinese media. And uh, the most recent one was uh, from uh, somebody who wants to do some coverage on the Greater Bay Area, um, the, the Shanghai, you know, joint Hong Kong Shenzhen uh, project. And I sa said the same thing. I said, I want to talk about some of the issues. I want to find out when you were building this project, what problems did you face? What problems still exist that haven't been resolved yet? And they're actually really open minded to it. So, for, to, so I might I might go and I might go and do that. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think you're, you know, right. That there needs to be a, a middle ground that people explore a bit more. But I also think the story of Hong Kong is really important to keep telling. And I really want to encourage people. I know you've got to go soon. So I'll wrap up with, with talking about this. I really encourage people, even if they already know the other side of the story, like we do uh, to read this, uh, it really wraps it up in a, in a really nice way, but especially people who, yeah, who don't know the full story because even though the Hong Kong protests are over, we shouldn't just walk away from it and say, this is done and do one of those page turners and say, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Cause even to this day, you know, there are people with very little knowledge of the level of violence that, that Hong Kong faced. They don't know mm -hmm. that Joshua Wong glorified protesters, you know, using arson and Molotov cocktails, calling them fire magicians, which, which happened shortly before, you know, these people lit a man on fire. Um, you know, student leaders are on record saying they'd never condemn the violence from the protesters. Nathan Law, when he was asked about the guy who was lit on fire, he said, yeah, it was unproportional. And, but basically, at the end of the day, we're doing this for your own good. We're doing this for the Hong Kong people. You have to understand we're fighting for the Hong Kong people. And these are people who are still celebrated as heroes today. Uh, they're the people of Hong Kong who were silenced during the protests from the protesters know very well about this lesson. But there's a really, really important lesson wrapped up in here for everybody else outside of Hong Kong to really recognize. Don't take things for face value. As you said, don't be cynical, but have a healthy amount of skepticism and look for those alternate opinions. That was the big wake up call for me for what mm. happened in 2019. And it's what drove me to even make this channel and start making content. Mm. And, mm. And, and so I, I really appreciate what you did with this book. And I, I don't know if, I know you've got to go by 1130. So if you wanted to wrap up on any final thoughts in that direction, yeah, uh, yeah. go ahead. Well, let me just turn that back on, on you. Um, it's, uh, it's funny, the small voices like, uh, you know, uh, I first saw you as this strange guy, he just said, you know, with a phone in his car saying, uh, I just dropped off my kids <laughs> at school and I thought I'd share a few thoughts. And I just thought, wow, humble beginnings. But this guy is telling more truth than the entire BBC with its global tens of thousands of, of people. So I just thought, uh, this is this is the time, the democratization of the media, where the guy sitting in his car telling his small truth can actually explode around the world and the bbc with its uh, uh hundreds of thousands a million what's the budget 30 million pounds or something this unbelievable budget uh can be throwing um, untruths out and uh, and the little guy can fight it's 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 our time it's our period has come, so. I, I i hope so and you know all it takes it, for other people interested in doing that as well is to just listen to people because like you it, it was a matter of talking to the people in hong kong who really wanted something to say but were uh, too afraid to say it and uh, the mainstream media were disinterested in hearing from um that's all it took and and it goes tr it, the truth is uh, the same in both directions i regularly uh, spoke with protesters i had uh, you know one friend who was extremely supportive of the protesters and even the violence and i had regular conversations with her and we would have little mini debates and stuff like that and you know through various calls or i'd go over and visit her and talk about her we'd get each other's perspective <laughs> it's just important to talk to everyone because I'm convinced if you talk to everybody, if you talk to people who are extremely anti-China, extremely pro-China, supporting the protesters, against the protesters, you would have come away with a view that was, dare I say, closer to what we were presenting. Uh, people can claim that we've got our own biases or whatever. That's fine. But uh, people didn't even give themselves the chance to figure out, OK, where do I really stand on this issue when I'm when I give myself the chance to listen to everybody? And I think that's what we, we've got to do going forward. But you know what? I, again, you know, I encourage everybody to read your book. Check out your new uh, the, the website address is Friday. FridayEveryday.com. FridayEveryday.com. I'm really interested in collaborating also. We could even, you know, get together for a video once in a while on stories that you find are very um, important or that you want to get out there because um, I've got quite a big following in Hong Kong, uh, obviously, because that's what I covered to begin with. But I, I hope we can get together uh, more often because, uh, yeah, a lot of good synergies here. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And we'll speak Thanks again very soon. much. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much for joining and uh, I'll see you next time. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Yep.